pioneer. Um, so they, they needed to develop all of those uh, policies and practices and, and um, you know, explore all of that de novo. The fertile ground was definitely there and the need was there. Um, and if we look to, you know, today, all of those things are in place now. And that's only in a 20 to 25 year period that we now have all of these resources. And biobanking is now a standalone scientific um, sector. Um, that is fully professionalized with education available, best practices, a journal of its own, and so on. <clears throat> so going back to what researchers need, here's what I believe the typical goal of a researcher is when they're trying to obtain specimens for their projects. Um, they need to know that they have enough samples to power their studies statistically. They need to know that the samples are fit for their downstream application. So it's gonna match what it, whatever it is they wanna do with it. If they wanna do a SNP study or if they wanna do um, you know, deep sequencing or uh, PCR or whatever it is they wanna do with these samples, IHC, that the sample that they're using is gonna match that downstream application. So both in the prep type, but also the quality. Is the quality research grade? in that respect. They also need to know that the samples are compliant with um, ethical requirements and privacy regulation. That will determine whether or not the researcher is allowed to use those samples. Uh, you know, is there su sufficient um, coverage for um, the right kind of approvals? Um, there's also now requirements um, requested by publishers. So if you want to publish um, using human biospecimens in any of the nature publishing group, um, series of journals, there are some minimum requirements that they expect. They need you to demonstrate ethics, of course, but they also need to demonstrate something called risk requirements. It's a minimum amount of information regarding the biobanking information, uh, biobanking practices that went into um, obtaining those samples, including collection parameters and, and uh, sample description parameters. So a publisher might require you to have certain information. Funders now have um, some requirements. Um, so there are Canadian funders that require that any biomaterials be obtained from a biobank that is at least CEDARnet certified, the Canadian tissue for um, repository networks, <clears throat> um, for repositories network. Set that one a little funny. Um, and, and in some instances, um, it may need to be um, support, or there, there may need to, there's some requirements that are required for FDA or Health Canada submissions. And those are primarily around a uh, record keeping, um, adequate record keeping for those samples that is traceable and it can be produced, um, you know, as sometimes as long as 25 years later. <clears throat> So here are researcher perceptions. This is a little bit of an older study now, going back 10 years, but it's still relevant today. So this was a survey that was done across the United States. They surveyed quite a high number of researchers to ask them, are you able to get what you need? And when you get it, is it good enough quality? And they found that a large majority of researchers couldn't find the numbers that they need, and even larger than that, couldn't find the quality that they need. So that's really the space that biobanks are trying to fill. Um, and of course, having low quality specimens resulted in them questioning their findings and, and how, uh, you know, how, how awful is that, that a researcher would invest so much time and energy and yet at the end they, they question their findings because of the quality of the specimens. <clears throat> so how do researchers find their samples? Um, there's a, a number of different ways in which they can do this. These are all legitimate ways to gain access to samples. None of these is better than the other. Um, they can come from a colleague's freezer. Or they can come from uh, you know, do it yourself. Um, you know, get your own research um, ethics board application, design your own consent form, um, consent your own patients, process them, put them in your own freezer, that sort of thing. That can happen. And that's completely legitimate as well. Or they can gain them from a biobank. The advantages of working with a biobank is that the biobank will have already pre-thought um, what kind of SOPs are required to ensure quality and compliance. <clears throat> so um, on a prospective basis, the, the, the biobank could collect samples immediately for your study um, over a period of time, or samples could be already available in the freezer and they can be um, you know, ready access and 
get your samples within 30 days instead of waiting, um, you know, two to five years to acquire those same specimens. <clears throat> so what is a biobanking principle? <clears throat> so here's the official definition. The official, this is from ISBR, the International Society for Biological and Environmental Repositories. This is the only global society for biobanking. And this is the official definition that comes from the published best practices. It's an entity that receives, stores, processes, and or distributes specimens as needed. It encompasses the physical location as well as the full range of activities associated with its operation. <clears throat> So there, so that's pretty broadly encompassing. It doesn't say anything about being clinical versus research. It doesn't say anything about being, uh, you know, health-based versus diversity-based. It's just that you have a collection of uh, specimens that you can store or also distribute, and that it also covers not just the freezer or the cabinet in which they are stored, but also all of those operations that go into um, collecting and maintaining that collection. And the purpose of the repository is to supply biological materials and the data in a form that meets specific quality criteria um, and provided in, in compliance with, uh, of course, regulatory and statutory obligations. <clears throat> Here's a snapshot of the different kinds of biobanks that we might see and the different ways that we might stratify those. Um, so, um, you know, the, the vision, mission, intended purpose, intended utility is going to, in many respects, determine how um, those uh, different areas are stratified. Um, and, and that should be, you know, everything should tie up to that one um, top level um, mission or vision. So we can just stratify it by, uh, you know, sector. The sector, um, is it within a hospital? Is it uh, an NGO, as in the case of, you know, uh, OICR? Is it an academically driven? Is it commercial driven? And we can talk about the types. Um, is it a disease specific biobank, a pediatric? Is it IV bio, veterinary diversity, museum, and so on? So many different kinds that we can um, bring into play there. What kind of access model? So is it a, um, poly, oligo, or mono user. I'll talk about that on the next slide. Are we supporting only academic researchers? Are we also going to support pharma, startup biotech, and so on? Um, or do we work through a distributor model where there's a, you know, a, a middle person who helps to um, gain access to potential researchers? We can also talk about the funding or sustainability model. So is it core funded? Is it grant funded? Is it self-funded? Self-funded is not very typical and biobanking is extremely expensive. It's a very expensive thing to do. Um, so there does typically need to be some level of core funding. We can also talk about the governance model. Um, we can talk about collection and storage procedures. How are the samples collected? Is it primarily a cryogenic biobank or is it a living bank? Some of them are living, super cool, where they have, uh, you know, there's one in Peru that is a, a living um, tree biobank. So they have all these different kinds of trees that are on a plot of land that they keep alive. And that's, that's a form of biobank um, <clears throat> or dried or cultures or so on. Um, we can talk about what the sampling model is. Is it a population? So you're grabbing a very large demographic or is it targeted to specific disease type? Um, and then the model itself. And I'll talk about the model on the next um, slide. Oh, not the next one. The next one after that. So a little bit about um, biobanking in Canada. We have uh, done our very best efforts to survey the number of biobanks that there are in Canada. And it looks like there are about um, more than 10,000 biobanks. A very large number of these are what we call mono-user. So they are cohorts that were developed to satisfy a single study or a single researcher. Um, <clears throat> there are some that are oligo. So we, but we mean by that is that a couple of researchers got together and decided to grow this cohort um, together as a, as a joint project. And then the poly-user is a biobank that um, collects and then shares it with many, many researchers, as many as possible. Those ones tend to be the uh, professionalized biobanks, so to speak, um, the ones that are a central resource. 
So biobank models, um, here's some examples of what I, I mean by a biobank model. It's also sometimes called the biobank business model. Um, a classic biobank, this is what was initially imagined, you know, 20, 25 years ago about what a biobank would do and what their purpose was and, and the advantages of that. And since then, there have been some other models that have evolved from there. Um, so the pros of having a classic biobank are that we um, accelerate research very quickly. So we're collecting materials for some future unknown use. We put it in the freezers and then as a researcher needs it, they can pull it out right away. They don't have to wait at all. It's, it's ready now. So they don't have to start up a whole collection. They don't have to go through the ethics. They don't have to accrue patients. They don't have to wait for all of that to happen, which can take for some disease sites, it can take 10 years before you have anything that is meaningful for a research project. What a biobank does is it collects it in, in anticipation of that. So it's, it's ready immediately. This allows also data to mature. Um, you know, an example of prostate cancer where we don't know again for a 10 year period, who is going to progress, who is going to fail treatment, who's going to perish from their disease. It takes a really long time. Um, and these kinds of biobanks allow for that kind of research to occur in an efficient way. We also can enable uh, rare diseases to accumulate, um, which is not possible if we're looking through a different model. Cons are it's expensive. It is very expensive. It costs roughly, so the, the literature, there's quite a bit of literature on what it costs for a cancer biobank. And it costs anywhere from $750 to $1,500 per patient to um, collect their materials and, and maintain it over time. Um, it's also a bit of unpredictable utilization because we're collecting for future unknown use. We don't know um, when it's, um, uh, we don't know what material is necessarily useful. Um, and uh, the current metrics are on that is that most biobanks of this model are actually only releasing about 10% of their materials over time. And there's some reasons for that. There's some really valid reasons. Some of it has to do with the inherent nature of a classic biobank. And you just have to admit that there's going to be some dead stock and, and be okay with that. But the more professionalized biobanks are seeing about 20 to 35% um, distribution. And that's, that's a healthy range. We move down the line. Um, the next model is a prospective biobank. So this biobank doesn't store anything at all. It collects it and sends it off to a researcher as needed. Um, so these will be for a defined um, research project. The clinical trials um, biobanks operate under this parameter as well. Um, the benefits is that it's 100% utilization, really good cost recovery, and you have an empty biobank, so no freezers filling up. But it does take time to accrue, very limited to early data, and it's limited to abundant diseases. So none of those rare diseases or opportunities to mature any data to use this, um, this uh, um, kind of uh, material from this kind of biobank. Another kind of model is a data biobank. So this is a, a, um, a biobank that will not release specimens, but they will release, release characterized information. So they may have the clinical data collected. They will have collected the samples, but then they will extract the DNA and do omics on that and release only the omics data along with the clinical data. The benefit of that is that it never exhausts. So this material is, is um, something that can be used repeatedly. A services biobank will um, provide services to researchers who want to start their own collection, or they will provide um, you know, services to other biobanks. And then there's other models that are popping up all the time. And we're seeing a lot of biobanks move into kind of a hybrid um, model or hybrid scenario where they're combining one or more of these models to fit the, um, the needs of their research um, community. <clears throat> bit about quality. So fit for purpose is a matter of these four main pillars, um, collection and processing. So what methodologies you're using and also the variability in that practice of the prep type. So is it a block versus a frozen tissue sample versus a blood fraction? Um, those all have different utility. The storage conditions can make a big impact on the quality of the materials. So whether they're stored at 
you know, room temperature minus 20, minus 80, and cryogenically at min minus 150 and below. Um, and also even what kind of tubes they're using or we're using the, the plastics um, themselves can have binding properties that can affect the quality of the material. And then the quality of data. So if data is not available, the whole thing is useless. Um, these samples are not relevant at all if, if the right kind of data isn't attached to it. And over top of that, we have a quality management system, a QMS, to ensure consistency and conformance across these four pillars. <clears throat> um, this comes into play even more so if we're looking, if a researcher needs to collect samples across multiple studies. So, um, you know, issues with variability at one biobank is going to compound when we have issues at another biobank and we need to pull samples together. <clears throat> We have seen this in irreproducibility of research data. Uh, this was a um, paper that went out in Nature in a special edition on irreproducibility that they put out. Amgen tried to confirm published findings from 53 landmark studies. So not just any studies, they picked landmark ones and they could only verify 6% or 11% of those. Um, and Bayer did the same thing, and they were only able to confirm 25% of published findings. Now, of course, this isn't all relating to specimens. It's relating to variability in the research itself. Um, but I do hold a lot of responsibility for not contributing to this problem by ensuring good quality specimens are collected and maintained. <clears throat> A bit about temperature. So this one comes up all the time. What do you mean I can't keep them at minus 80? What's wrong with minus 80? Everything's frozen. Um, well, we don't, we don't actually know. Um, we don't know that unless we test that. <clears throat> um, and we have to keep them at that temperature for a really long time. So we're not just storing it at minus 80 for a couple of months. And that's sufficient for a research project, say in a research setting. Um, we might be storing it for 10 or 20 years and we don't know what the impact of that is. So, you know, it's important because it can take a long time for data to mature. It can take a long time for rare diseases to accrue. Samples might not be needed right away. And those are reasons they might be stored at that temperature for extended periods. And over time, um, damage accrues, damage, damage accumulates. And we did a study on this. Um, at my biobank that looked at um, the impact of cryogenically frozen um, temperatures on um, the quality of RNA and DNA in whole tissue. And we found that there was no relationship. So we are confident that we can continue to store our samples at um, minus 150 and lower. However, temperature effects are very widely reported at other temperatures. Um, so at minus 80, RNA is degraded within 19 to 24 months. We're seeing the effects of that. RNA fragmentation is happening. It's not just RNA, but also PSA, TSH can be affected. Um, plasma, there's uh, studies that conclude that it should also be stored in liquid nitrogen. That's what LN2 is. Um, and then we also see effects of freeze-thaw. Okay, we all knew that freeze-thaw is a big deal, but also thermocycling. So that's maintaining above and below minus 150 or, or the glass state, which I'll, I'll describe in a second. The reason for this is because biological specimens are very complex mixtures. <clears throat> if you recall eating a freezy when, when you're little or maybe not so little, um, and, uh, you know, at first you get this really good hit of flavor and um, all the blue dye comes out and your tongue turns blue and it's really super sweet. And by the time you get halfway to the end, all you're left with is a piece of clear ice. And that's because even though the freezy is entirely frozen, the different components melt and freeze at different rates. Um, and that's a very simple um, mixture. Freezy is a really simple mixture when we compare that to the human body or to human cells. And in the end, it's not over until the last component is frozen. A lot of the components in a human cell are not frozen at minus 80. They're not frozen, they're still liquid and they're still active even though the water portion is frozen. So that's why it's a bit of a big deal. Um, taking it to a, a magical um, thermometer that can never really measure this full range. Um, if we were to look at it in concept, um, you know, we have water freezing at minus zero. Water freezes again uh, in a different way at minus 137. It moves from a crystalline state 
through a rubbery state into a glass state. And when it's in glass state, that is finally when water is fully immobilized and it cannot contribute to chemical reactions. That's also the temperature where a lot of degradative enzymes or those other components in a human cell is, is fully vitrified. Um, so that's, that's why um, uh, we're very concerned with temperature. <clears throat> so standards and harmonization can improve quality. Just going back to these slides and harmonization improves compatibility. Um, there are a lot of best practices and standards that are now available and they do play a role in improving the quality of a bioresource or a biobank. So there's lots of places that anyone who wants to create a cohort can go to for guidance. Um, the big one is ISPR. So ISPR is the only international society that tackles all of the issues relating to, um, to biobanking. And then there are a number of accreditations or certifications or other standards that can be looked to as well. A bit on terminology, uh, best practice is a level of operation above basic recommended practice. So it's really the best way of doing something. A certification is a third party providing some written assurance that a biobank is meeting best practice. And accreditation is another way of a third party um, ensuring that there's conformance to best practice. And the standard is again, a, another third party way of ensuring that there's conformance to best practice. So it all comes up to best practice. <clears throat> so the is for best practices, the intent of this one is for the harmonization of scientific, technical, legal, ethical issues in, um, that are relevant to repositories. So it, it's intended to improve the quality management, it's intended to improve guidance, and it's intended to assist and optimize existing practices. Um, these are, are now on the fourth iteration. They have been around for quite a long time now, uh, 15 to 20 years. I can't remember the exact date that they were released, um, but we're now in the fourth edition and we're beginning to draft the fifth edition um, release. And it, it expands and grows in scope every time. <clears throat> What is a best practice? So they're the um, methods, techniques, procedures used to maintain quality as a complement to what the regulatory standards are. So we in Canada, we have TCPS2, the Tri-Council Policy Statement. We also have a PHIPA in Ontario, that's the um, Personal Health Information Protection Act. Um, those are mandatory. These are complementary to that that will help ensure good quality of the, the biobank itself and the samples. The recommendations, they're not mandatory, but they're, they're, they're strongly recommended. <laughs> um, so they're effective to, um, uh, they're guidelines on effective management. And these are developed in consensus and they're evidence-based wherever possible. Um, and whether or not they're adopted really depends on the need of the biobank itself. Here's an example, this is a really simple example. Having a generator is a good idea, so it describes what a generator is. And then the best practice is that you will have a generator and it will have enough fuel supply to run continuously for a minimum of 48 hours and preferably 72 with the ability to refuel. So if you're in a situation where all the lights go out, there's no power, at least you've got your generator um, available and fully um, supplied to manage that crisis. <clears throat> so the best practice flows into these certification and accreditation um, programs. Um, the best practices are used to inform the, the development of those, um, those different programs. <clears throat> Here's a snapshot. I'm not going to get into all of the details of these. There's the Canadian Tissue Repository Network, ISO, um, which I think everybody's pretty familiar with. And then there's an accreditation program um, by the College of American Pathologists. A bit about each. Um, the Canadian um, version is uh, funded by CHR, so it really is a Canadian product. Um, it was developed by five top tier biobanks, the charter uh, members across Canada that was spanning across five different provinces. OTB was one of those. Um, and we developed a program that is based on education. So, you know, we believe that the more educated and knowledgeable a biobanker are, the better equipped they will be to um, run a quality biobank and have quality samples. 
Um, so to fit to this model, the biobank has to demonstrate that they have SOPs that align with uh, required operating protocols. That's when the ROP is that there's ethics in place. They have relevant staff that have um, received all of the training. <clears throat> CAP accreditation is a three-year continuous cycle of quality management. They have to go through a number of steps that includes a third-party inspector. So there's a checklist. The biobank has to meet all of the requirements on the checklist. An external auditor will come and ensure conformance. <clears throat> ISO is quite similar to that. It's a standard that was developed um, across all of the member countries to ISO, Canada being one of those. Um, there is at the top of the umbrella, a document that is relevant to uh, biobanking as a whole. And then there are a number of other standards beneath that that can play a supporting role to that. <clears throat> Again, a third party auditor will come into the biobank to ensure um, conformance and will provide um, the accreditation accordingly. <clears throat> Education does play a very large role in harmonization and um, now it's really readily available. So if anybody's interested in making biobanking their professional practice, there are avenues available to do that now. That wasn't available 10 years ago at all. So biobankers kind of had to get their own knowledge in their own way, either through practice or through um, interacting with other biobankers. Um, so there's an essential courses in biobanking that's available jointly through ISPR and CEDARNET. If you're Canadian, go straight to CEDARNET. <clears throat> Um, there are um, courses, full uh, university programs that are now available. There's one in Luxembourg and then there's one here um, that is available through UBC. Um, there is actually a course at U of T, so a course offered by uh, U of T that is run by Diane Chadwick, really good biobanker, and George Youssef from St. Michael's Hospital. Um, they've developed that program, and I think this is the first term that it's being offered, so that's pretty exciting. Um, there's also the qualification in biorepository science. So this is for professionals who are already, say, a pathologist assistant, and they already have that uh, level of qualification. They can now apply um, to this. Um, it is open to individuals who are not pathologist assistants. Um, there's some eligibility criteria, like you need a degree, you need to demonstrate what kind of degree there is, and then uh, a certain level of competence in biobanking to be eligible to write the exam. And at the end of the exam, a new qualification is granted. <clears throat> Okay, getting into ISBER, this kind of is the big daddy of um, resources available to biobanks. And for anyone who's interested in biobanking, this is uh, one of the first places um, that I would recommend an individual go. So like I said, it's the only global society that's dedicated to biobanking and all of its practices. It provides opportunities for networking, education, innovating, and uh, harmonizing approaches to really sticky problems that we may all collectively um, encounter. It is open to all kinds of biorepositories, so not just biological, but also environmental, not just health, but also maybe veterinary or diversity, museums, um, marine science, and so on. It offers conferences. There's an annual conference and then a number of regional conferences that happen throughout the year. There are webinars that are available on demand and some of them are offered live. A number of tools available to, um, to biobanks as they need them. Again, the qualification program. There's a forum. I have a question. Sometimes I have a question. <laughs> I'm having this problem at my biobank. Anybody else worldwide had this issue and I can type it into the forum and I get about 40 responses that'll help guide me in my next, uh, my next steps. <clears throat> it also has an official journal um, that is arranged through Mary Liebert Publishing. Um, so we, we do have a dedicated journal for biobanking. And of course the primary um, output of this um, not-for-profit volunteer run society is the best practices. <clears throat> There are some other societies that individuals can look to as well. Um, BBR Mara Eric is a European consortium. ESBB is European, Middle Eastern, and African. And then the Society for Cryobiology focuses on very cold um, temperature storage. And those are all really good ones to go to as well. There are a few others um, that are complementary to this space. This space. Uh, I just don't have time to go into all of them. 
<clears throat> so I did want to point out a little bit about moving beyond that just one slide on moving beyond quality. Um, back in the early days, biobanks were so focused on um, quantity, just okay, we're running, let's see how many we can get, let's get these freezers full. And that was the primary goal. That was about 20 years ago. And then it was discovered that um, maybe that fell a bit short to the needs of researchers. They weren't getting quite the quality that they needed. And then there was a giant push on quality and uh, you know, refocus on what kind of practices do we need to have in place to ensure a good quality of specimens and that they are fit for purpose for their downstream application. And we have now moved beyond that in, uh, as a biobanking sector to focus more on uh, sustainability is a big one, keeping the biobanks relevant and um, healthy from a financial perspective, but also focusing more on impact of the biobank. So what impact do we make on the research community? So that is utilization. How many samples are getting used versus how many are going in? Um, and what kind of impact are we looking at with respect to the number of research projects, the complexity of the research projects, the publications that come out, the quality of the publications that come out, the impact factor of those publications. Um, so that's where the mindset of the biobanking community is now. <clears throat> I'd love to share with you some of the coolest biobanks that I've encountered over the years. Um, starting with this one, the Cornell Veterinary Biobank um, has about 20,000 unique animals in it. They focus on uh, all domestic species of animals. Um, and they, um, you know, as their tagline says, they really are bridging the back gap between patient care and clinical research innovations. One of the things that they explore is the 3,000 diseases that um, these domestic animals and humans have in common and how research um, to benefit these animals in their lives also translates to benefiting humans. And this is the only veterinary biobank worldwide that is ISO accredited. <clears throat> this biobank is from the San Diego Zoo. Um, they have what's called a frozen zoo with 10,000 living cell cultures. And what they have done with these living cell cultures is um, this, they're, they're saving species that are on the verge of extinction. So where um, there is very limited species of, or um, animals left um, in that species, they are able to um, help them reproduce. And they, they reproduced a white rhino and a cheetah and brought them back from the very edge of extinction. <clears throat> This is a UK population biobank. They have half a million participants that have donated urine, saliva, and blood samples. This is a picture of their cold storage. Their cold storage is entirely roboticized. It is super cool. So they have a little panel on the wall that they can do their entry in and the robot will go and pick those samples and bring it to them. Really sophisticated. The Canadian equivalent to the UK Biobank is CanPath. CanPath is headed by Phil Awadala, who is our OICR researcher. And we have 330,000 Canadians that have uh, provided data and materials to this cohort. <clears throat> Biobanking in outer space. So NASA has a biobank. I've had the... <sighs> the absolute privilege of meeting the individuals involved in, in this biobank. What they do is they both send materials to space and collect materials in space and then have them shuttled down. Um, they, they, they actually come down in, in the parachutes um, and they land somewhere in the middle of whatever desert and they retain the samples for that and put them in the freezers. Um, very interestingly, anyone who's done any um, mouse work, um, you know, you know that a mouse generally costs about $50 um, for a study. <clears throat> when you take a mouse from Earth and put it up into outer space to conduct research and then return um, the samples back to, back down to the planet, that one mouse model is now worth over a million dollars. So they have to be extremely careful with their 
quality procedures um, so that they don't mess up that, that one N because even just messing up one sample has cost them as much as a Toronto house. <laughs> And this is a really beautiful um, biobank that is, uh, that's a building that's wedged into the side of a perpetually frozen mountain that is very near the North Pole. It's a group called Crop Trust, and again, a not-for-profit group. They have over a million varieties of seeds in there, and what their goal is to preserve our food diversity. And a beautiful example of the success of this was, um, uh, when Syria, um, there, there was a moment where Syrians um, lost a bunch of diversity due to war. They, they lost a, a bunch of their crop diversity. The seeds were abolished. They, they were gone and they couldn't raise their cultural foods anymore. But the crop vault or the crop trust had some foresight there and had already preserved them. And they were able to resurrect those important cultural food crops. <clears throat> Okay, moving on to a little bit about OTB. Um, so we're a biobank at the Ontario, uh, at the OICR. Um, we've been in operation for uh, 17 years now. We started collecting in 2004, um, and the first uh, sample being collected in early September. We're called a multi-node biobank. So we work out of a number of hospitals across the province, Kingston, London, Hamilton, and Ottawa. The uh, patients are consented within those hospitals uh, and they're stored in cryogenic freezers there in liquid nitrogen. The data is transferred through a portal and is stored on servers encrypted at OICR. <clears throat> and then we at OICR, we will work with researchers all over the world to identify what it is they need for their study, pull it out of our freezers, pack it up with the data and make that available to them at deeply subsidized rates. <clears throat> So for an academic researcher in Canada, we will provide that for about a 90 to 95% discount off of our genuine cost. Oops, wrong one, there we go. We have consented about 22,000 um, patients for about 200,000 specimens. And we have this available in a number of prep types um, so that we can suit downstream applications and a number of disease sites. Um, and we make that also available with DNA, RNA, or some services that we can provide with that. Of course, bundled up with the clinical data. <clears throat> nope, there we go. We are a hybrid biobank model. So we started as a classic biobank, and then researchers came to us repeatedly asking, you know what, I really need fresh. If you freeze the blood, it doesn't work for me anymore. Or if you freeze the tumor, it doesn't work for me anymore. I need it fresh so that I can do organoid development or I can do microtumor um, studies. <clears throat> so we moved into a, a hybrid model that includes a prospect collection. And at, at this moment, we're also building out a data component model where a number of these samples are characterized up front. We are certified by the Canadian Tissue Repository Network. We're very active in ISBER so that we can maintain a strong contact to the global biobank community and learn from that. There's a good knowledge exchange that happens. And our processes for, for processing materials, the, the actual procedures, are third-party proficiency tested by a group in Luxembourg. <clears throat> This is the impact that we've had on research, the great amount of, of research that we have accelerated. Uh, 45,000 aliquots have been sent to researchers and used in their studies. That is from 10,000 donors, or about half our donors um, are being used directly in, in research studies. And this is in the support of over 300 research paper or projects. And as far as we know about uh, 180 known publications, sometimes research, researchers, them, they don't tell us when they publish something, even though they're supposed to, but they forget to tell us. But there's 180 that we know about. And that's as many as uh, a really strong PI might produce in their entire lifetime. So we're quite, we're quite um, proud of this accomplishment and, and the research that we've been able to support. <clears throat> so if you want to know more about biobanking, um, again, the first place to go is go to ISBER. The second place to go in, in complement is CEDARNET and biobanking.org, which is a complementary um, website to CEDARNET, 
those are really the best places to go. And if you want to know about more cutting edge science in biobanking, the Journal of Biopreservation and Biobanking would be the best place to go. All right, super happy to take questions.